a city called heaven across a beautiful sea there's a city called heaven and it's waiting just going someplace and I'm a hoping that that somewhere leads a close to Jesus was shaken and every eye gazed upward at the appearance. Jesus has come to take us home and now we're at the place he prepared for us. What will it be like the day after the appearance? Well, good evening again, and I want to especially welcome those of you who are tuning in from the satellite locations around North America. Can you believe that we are finally down to the last night of the appearing? Have you all here in the studio audience enjoyed yourself as you've heard Pastor Sean bring these messages? I can tell you it's Pastor Sean's desire and the entire It Is Written team's desire that every single one of you that have participated in this have drawn a little closer to Jesus Christ and that you have had an opportunity to, to expect with great anticipation, the appearing. Tonight, the, the title of this program for this evening is The Day After. I know you're going to enjoy this. Please welcome Pastor Sean Boonstra. Good evening. Welcome back to our fifth and final night in this five-part series. And I know some people are still thinking it was only five nights. 
I would like to study this just a little bit more, and I would too. And often when I present Bible prophecy, I'll go 20, 25, 30 nights, and I still haven't hit the end of it. And there is so much to study. And I know a lot of people are saying, okay, we went five nights, but I have questions. And there's so much more that I would love to study. What's next? Well, there are a lot of things that you can do. We talked a little bit about the book, The Appearing. It covers a lot of stuff I just haven't had time to cover in, uh, in the last few nights as we've been together. So the book has a lot of good information in it. Plus, wherever you are tonight, talk to your host, your moderator, right there where you are, because wherever you are, you will have an opportunity to continue studying Bible prophecy. There will be a group there in your area, home groups in some places, or groups that meet in a church, that will continue to study the prophecies of the Bible so that you don't have to stop. You can keep on going. Now, there is another opportunity that I would love to tell you about. If I could just slip it in for a moment, I am going to do what I call the graduate course in Bible prophecy come March. It is going to be 20-some sessions, not all in a row. We'll take a few breaks along the way, but we are going to do it live by satellite, again to audiences across North America and all around the world beginning in uh, the spring. It's called Revelation Speaks Peace. It is from Phoenix, Arizona, going to the whole world uh, all at once. I can't wait. I wish we could begin the graduate course right now, but you didn't come for the graduate course. You came for night number five. And our subject tonight is the day after. Where will you be one day after the appearing? It is my belief again tonight that the Bible is not an ordinary book, that God has inspired people to write it, that He is its genuine author, and that we need to ask His blessing. So I ask that you would bow your heads with me as we look at our final subject in this series. Our gracious Father in heaven, how our hearts long to see Jesus come. We wait for the day when we will look up in the eastern sky and see him coming. We long for the appearing. We long for that day when we can put this world behind and step into the next. We would like to hear the voice of Jesus for real. We would like to see him for real. But tonight you have given us an avenue by which we can see and hear him. It is the word of God. We believe there is power in this book to change lives and to draw us to Jesus Christ. I ask tonight in a very special way that you would bless my words. Father, that tonight would not be a night when we study human opinion, but that tonight would be a night when we hear your voice, the voice of the almighty creator, speaking to us, reminding us how much you love us. For I ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. When I was a kid, which wasn't very long ago at all, there was a hole in my bedroom floor. Now that's because I lived up on the second story. You say, what do you mean? You lived in your bedroom? Yeah, just about. I spent a lot of time in there reading book after book after book. And there was a hole in my bedroom floor. The reason there was a hole in my bedroom floor, it was a vent that they had cut in the floor to let the heat from the wood stove come upstairs at night. And I got this idea one time as I was laying in bed. I was thinking to myself, you know, my mother and father are downstairs sitting by that wood stove talking. And I'll bet as they talk, they're going to talk about me. So I crawled out of bed all the way across the floor and I put my ear to that vent because I had this hunch that when people don't know you're listening, they're likely to tell the truth about how they feel about you. And I was just a little worried on the odd occasion of how mom and dad still felt after the day that I had blessed them with all day long. So I got out of bed at night and I would put my ear to that vent and I would listen. And you know something? Most of the time, it wasn't too bad. People tell the truth about you when they don't think you're listening. Now, let me ask you a question tonight. What do you think God thinks about you? What would he say about you if nobody were listening? I have good news tonight. I know exactly what he would say because I heard it. What do you mean, preacher? Are you hearing voices? No, not at all. I actually eavesdropped on a sacred conversation between God the Son and God the Father. It is found in the Bible. You know, they talk about this passage in the Sermon on the Mount being the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. But that's a pattern that Jesus gave people to pray by. He didn't actually pray it in that instance. But there is a prayer that he prayed found in the Gospel according to John chapter 17. 
And almost down to the end of that prayer, listen to what Jesus says. He says something about how he feels about you. He's speaking to his father. John 17 and verse 24, we get to do a little bit of sacred eavesdropping. Father, he said, I will that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus is saying, Father, the thing that I want most is to have these people with me where I am. Now, somebody might say, oh, but he's talking about all of his disciples. He's talking about the 12th. Well, I've read the whole chapter, and in there Jesus says, I also mean those that will believe on me through their word. That's you and I, because we have the disciples' word in the Bible. Jesus said, Father, the greatest desire of my heart is to have those people with me where I am. And as a matter of fact, the Bible says that at this very moment, Jesus is not on some sort of vacation out in the universe somewhere until the second coming. He's busy doing something. He's busy preparing a place for you. The Bible tells me so in John 14, beginning in verse 2. The Bible says, In my Father's house are many mansions. How many mansions? There are many of them. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus said, there are a lot of places in heaven, many, many mansions. And yet so many of us, as we talked about the other night, believe that somehow God is trying to keep everybody out of heaven. He's doing his best to keep everybody out, but if somebody manages to get enough brownie points on their card, he just has to let them in because that's what the rules say. But God doesn't really want them there. I hear so many people talk about God like that, but Jesus reveals how God really feels. Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions. Why? Why? It's because God is making big plans. Jesus' desire is that many people be there. If it were not so, said Jesus, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Where do we get this idea that God's trying to keep everybody out of heaven? God would not give his only son if his desire was to keep you out of heaven. He gave the thing that was most precious to him because his desire is to have you there and to have as many of us there as possible. Why? The Bible reveals that Jesus wants you to enjoy what he has. He remembers still what it was like to be with us. Before we sinned, the Bible indicates in the book of Genesis that God himself would come in the cool of the evening and walk with Adam and Eve. Jesus remembers what that was like. The book of Revelation tells us that we were created for God's pleasure. He took delight in communing with us, in being a part of our lives, in being with us there day by day. He remembers those walks in the cool of the evening. He remembers strolling past the tree of life in the garden. He remembers walking by the rivers that watered those trees, and he misses it. Sin stole God's family, and the thing he wants more than anything in the universe is to have his family back. You know, some years ago, I met a young lady. She was 15 years old. She was coming to a prophecy seminar. And as she was sitting there day after day, evening after evening, studying the prophecies of God's word, she suddenly decided, I believe in this Jesus who is coming again. I want to give my life to him. So I sat down and I visited with this young lady. I said, this is the most wonderful decision you have ever made. She said, I know. And a tear showed up in the corner of her eye. She said, preacher, I've got to tell you something. My mother kicked me out of the house when I was 10 years old. I have been living on the streets for five years. I don't have a family until now. She said, I see it now in the Bible. I know why Jesus is coming back. He misses me. He misses his family, and I miss my family too. I'm so excited when Jesus comes. I have a family. I'm going to see my older brother, the Bible calls him. I'm going to see him face to face. He's preparing something wonderful for me. 
Oh, it's true. The Bible says that eye has not seen, ear has not heard the glories of the place that Jesus is preparing. You and I have been steeped and soaked in sin and suffering and pain and sorrow so long now that we can't even begin to imagine what it'll be like the day after Jesus comes and sin and suffering and pain will be a thing of the past. Let me ask you a question tonight. What do you think Jesus is preparing for you the day after the appearing. What is he getting ready? What is Christ preparing for you? The Bible gives us a little peek. Now, when I was a kid, I, I, let me back up a little bit more than that. I have this problem with presents. I really do. When I buy my wife a present, I can't bear to wait for her birthday. I can't stand it. Once I have bought that present, I want to give it to her. And traditionally, I give it to her three, four, five days or two weeks before her birthday. I am bursting with excitement. I have to believe that as Jesus prepares a place for you for the day after the appearing, he's bursting with excitement. I know so because he gives a little glimpse of what he's going to give you in the Bible. Now, the other problem that I have with presents is this. When my parents would buy us a present, they did it every, every Christmas. They would put out some presents for us as little boys, and, and I couldn't stand it. My brother and I would get out of bed in the middle of the night, and, and this is terrible to admit. I know my mother's listening by satellite, and she doesn't know this. We would take a razor blade, and we would cut the tape, and we would open the pad. We couldn't stand it. And we would look at what was in there, and we would wrap it up, and then we would practice our surprised phase for Christmas morning. <laughs> we couldn't handle it. Now, God knows what that's like. Jesus wants to give us the gift. He can't wait to give it. And, and we want to get the gift. I can't wait to peek at what's inside. God has the answer. In the Bible, he gives us a little peek. Revelation 22 and verse 1. Listen to this. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits. Oh, I can't wait. I love fruit. And if there are 12 fruits on one tree, I've got my steak on three of them. There's going to be cherries and mangoes, and there are going to be grapes on that tree. I know the grapes don't grow on trees, but listen, this is heaven. Jesus can do anything for me. And, and if I could have a fourth one, it'd be pumpkins. And I know pumpkins don't grow on trees either, and it's technically not a fruit. But listen, I know there's pumpkin pie in heaven, amen? It's going to be there. All right. The tree of life which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree for, for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Let me ask you again, what is Jesus preparing for us. He can't wait to show us. He can't wait to reveal what it is. I'll tell you what Jesus is doing right now at this moment. He's getting ready to reverse every mistake we have ever made. Jesus is getting ready to reverse everything that we have done to this planet. You know something? There's an amazing pattern in the book of Revelation. Matter of fact, there's an amazing pattern in the entire Bible. When you and I write an essay, you remember writing essays? Yeah, it's been a while since I've had to write one. But do you remember writing essays? Yeah. Only three of you ever wrote an essay. <laughs> do you remember writing essays? Yes. Yeah, I do. Right? And I used to think that 100 words was a terribly long essay. Now I have to write 30,000-word essays. When we write an essay, we make three points and a conclusion. One, two, three, conclusion. We put the most important stuff at the end. Well, the Bible was written just a little bit differently. The Eastern mind didn't think like that. Here's how they thought. They made point one, two, three... And then they turned it around and made the same points in reverse order. Then they went three, two, one. And that's exactly what they did. They didn't put the most important stuff at the end. They put it in the middle. They built up to it and then went down. Some scholars call it chiastic structure because it looks like the Greek letter key. And key looks like an X. They said, look, they went down the X like this to the middle and they came back out. One, two, three, then three, two, one. Put the most important point in the middle. Now, this is true of the whole Bible. If you notice an interesting pattern in the Bible, it's this. In the book of Genesis, we have the beginning of sin. In the book of Revelation, we have the end of sin. The first three chapters, sin problem erupts on earth. The last three chapters of the Bible, God reverses it completely. It's a complete opposite. 
And right between those two is the cross of Jesus, the most important point in the whole Bible. Listen, the Bible begins in a garden and it ends in a garden. The Bible begins with man choosing sin and having a curse fall on the earth. The Bible ends, as we've just read, with God reversing that curse. The Bible begins with death and it ends with everlasting life. It begins and ends with a river and a tree and it begins, oh, it begins with a river and a tree and it ends with a river and a tree. The book of Revelation is Jesus undoing every mistake we have ever made. The last three chapters of the Bible are the reverse order of the first three chapters of the Bible. Why? Because Jesus remembers what it was like. And more than anything in the world, he wants what we had together back before we sinned. He wants the Garden of Eden back. He wants those walks in the cool of the evening. He wants to be with us. He remembers what it's like. Now, in your imagination, back up with me just a little bit in history, 6,000 years or so, and stand with me outside the Garden of Eden one or two months after Adam has sinned. The Bible says this in the book of Genesis. Genesis 3, verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Think about this. Adam heard Jesus coming. He knew he had done wrong. He knew that he had sinned, and so his heart began to thump wildly in his chest. It was the first time any human being had ever felt fear, ever. He was afraid, if you can believe it, of his maker. He was afraid of the one who created him for a relationship with God. He was afraid. And God, the Bible says, came into that garden with tears in his voice, crying, Adam, where are you? What have you done? God just lost his family. If you've ever suffered from a broken family, a divorce, a child that's turned its back on you, God knows exactly what it feels like. He went through the whole process. And the desire of Christ's heart is to turn that all around. Adam spoiled the garden. Now, my father had a garden. I thought that my father had the biggest garden in the world. I thought it was about 85 acres of potatoes. He had the world's largest garden. And in the summers when I was supposed to have a vacation, my father would wake me up very, very early and put on a pancake breakfast. And I knew what he was trying to do. He was trying to get my strength up for the day. The pancake breakfast was always a bad, bad thing. After I was done eating, Dad would pull out a list and say, Listen, I'm on my way to work right now. And I've got a few things that I need you to do. And after you're done these things, the rest of the day is yours. I said, Dad, okay, let's see the list. He'd pull it out. He says, I want you to cut firewood. Then I want you to wash the car. Then I want you to mow the lawn. And I'd be waiting. I'd be waiting like a condemned man on death row. I knew what was coming. Then I want you to go into the garden, he said, and pull weeds. My heart sunk. I hated that garden. I hated it with a passion. Dad would walk me outside, point to that garden and say, see all those weeds? They all need to be gone. And when they're all gone, the rest of the day is yours. Now, I tried to argue theology with Dad. I'd say, you know, Dad, the Bible says, let the wheat and the tares grow together till the harvest. <laughs> but that didn't work at all. I spent every summer morning on my knees, shackled to a garden trowel, digging up weeds. I hated gardening. Now, I have a theory. I have a theory. I believe that over time, Adam came to hate gardening too. Let me explain why I say that. Why did Adam hate gardening? Adam hated gardening because he knew what the garden had been like in paradise. Imagine Adam two months after he had sinned, pulling the first thorn out of the palm of his hand, maybe watching that wound become infected. What was it like for Adam to turn the soil and understand that now instead of living forever in a paradise with Jesus, Somebody was going to turn that soil one day as they dug his grave. What was it like for him to pick up a handful of dirt and to squeeze it and let it run through his fingers and know that he was going back to soil? For dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. As Adam heard the first animal being killed, he knew it was his fault. The whole order of things had changed. And it all must have come into great focus when he had to bury his son. The first funeral on planet Earth was an abnormal funeral. It wasn't a child burying their parent, it was a parent burying their child. Now, every funeral is abnormal, but those 
are the hardest ones. And Adam didn't have a funeral home to go to. Adam didn't have a group of friends to come to that funeral. Adam didn't have a silk lined casket or flowers or cards or anything. All he had was the body of his son and an open hole in the ground. And Jesus from heaven looked down and looked at that and with tears in his eyes decided, I don't like that either. I'm going to do everything I can to turn it all around. And Jesus pledged to us in the word of God. He says, I'm going to give you everything back if you can imagine it. We don't even deserve it. Jesus says, I'm going to turn it all around. I don't want to see those kinds of funerals. I want to be back in the garden with my family. I'm giving everything back. What's he going to give back? What's he going to give back? Eye has not seen, the Bible says. Ear has not heard. But there are some things we know about heaven beyond the shadow of a doubt. There are certainties that we know for sure. Would you like to see them? Yes. Are you sure you'd like to see them? Yes. You knew I was going to tell you anyway, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. The first thing we know for sure is that there's going to be a new earth. Look at this. Isaiah 65, verse 17. The Bible says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. He creates new heavens and a new what? Earth. earth. And the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. Jesus said it's going to be so wonderful, you won't even remember what this place is like. You might remember uh, a few nights ago, we saw that verse where Jesus said, the final contractions on planet Earth are just like a woman having a baby. It's very painful, but when the child comes, it's so joyful, you don't remember the pain. Jesus said, this world is going to be so wonderful, you will not remember how painful this one was. And the other thing he says is, look, there's going to be a new earth. Now, in the Bible, there's no question. We're going to heaven. Jesus said he made a place for us up there. Mansions. I can't, I've never lived in a mansion. I mean, most of my life, I've lived in an 1,100-square-foot house with two kids. It just, no, I haven't had kids most of my life. Let me take that back. <laughs> I've lived in tiny places. I want to live in a mansion. I want to see what Jesus got ready for me. We are going to heaven. But the Bible also says in Revelation 21 that the city comes down out of heaven and lands on this earth, and God makes a new earth. Think about this. Heaven is not going to be sitting on a fluffy crowd, cloud, strumming a harp throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Now, I've got nothing against harp music. It's nice. I could only strum a harp, though, for about two hours, and I'd be fed up. I'd strum my harp for two hours, and I'd say, now what next? They say, keep strumming your harp. It goes on throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Well, can I go somewhere else? No, you've got to sit on a fluffy cloud and do it. That's not heaven. The good news of the Bible is heaven is real. It's as solid as the planet you stand on now. It's a real life right here on earth. And the Bible says on that new earth, things are going to be a little bit different. As a matter of fact, the Bible points out some things about that new earth in three general categories. I wonder if you could guess what they are. I'll show you what they are. First of all, there will be changes in the natural world. Secondly, there will be changes in the political world. And thirdly, there will be some changes in the religious world. Now, does that ring a bell at all? It should if you've been with me for the last few nights. It does ring a bell because those are the same areas Jesus told us to watch as we wait for him to come. Jesus said, in the world you live in now, these areas are all going to fall apart on you. There will be famine, pestilence, plagues, earthquakes, wars, bad religion, false messiahs, all these problems. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, hey, I want to show you once and for all where sin goes. At the end of your program, it all falls apart, and then I'm going to replace it with God's government where nothing goes wrong. Look at what Jesus said. What does Jesus say about heaven and how the, uh, the new earth is going to be different from ours in the realm of natural things? Listen to what the Bible says. Isaiah 35 and verse 1. The Bible says, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. You know, I live here in Southern California. I have to water my grass eight times a day to keep it from turning brown. In heaven, I'm not going to have a water bill. The Bible says all the desert starts to blossom. And you know what Jesus is saying? If the desert start to blossom, there will never be a shortage again. How can anybody in the world go hungry if everything is abundant and blooming? Blossom as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly. Blossom how? abundantly. We will need nothing ever again and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. 
Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come. Your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. Wait a minute, said somebody. Why is there vengeance and recompense? I thought it was going to be nice. It is. We need to start to understand what God is angry about. He's not angry about you. He's angry about what has happened to you. He's angry about the kind of suffering you've had to live with, the kind of pain you've had to live with. That's why when Jesus comes, he wipes out every last trace of sin. It's because of what it has done to you. What is Jesus taking vengeance on? He's taking vengeance on the pain you've had to go through. He's taking vengeance on the suffering you've been through. He's taking vengeance on every funeral. And he gives a recompense. God is going to give everything back. He will come and save you, the Bible says. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Many for the first time, the first thing they see is Jesus. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Many for the first time, the first thing they hear is the trumpet blast. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart. That's a deer. Oh, I can't wait for that. When I get to heaven and I have my big mansion and I have a place on the new earth all of my own, I'm going to build a fence around it. Do you know why? I don't need a fence in heaven. There won't be criminals and there won't be animals that will come in and steal my stuff or, or, or rip me up. That's not going to happen in heaven, but I still want a fence. Do you know why? Because I'm the clumsiest kid on the face of the planet. I can't jump over a fence now, but when I get to heaven, I'm building a fence and you're all going to come over. You're going to watch me jump right over it. I'm going to leap like a heart. The lame man's going to leap and the tongue of the dumb will sing. I can't sing a note now, but you come. As soon as I jump my fence, I'm going to sing you a song. I'm going to be in heaven. For in the wilderness, water shall break out and streams in the desert. God says, you can't even begin to imagine what I'm about to hand you. Oh, said God, I know there are blind people. I know there are deaf people. I know there are lame. I know that you've been suffering. Some people think God doesn't notice our tears. He says, I notice, I'm going to give you so much, you'll never remember how much that hurt. The Bible says in Psalm 56 that God has been collecting our tears in a bottle. He saw every single one, and his promise is, I'm going to make up every one of those tears you ever shed, because Jesus has bought a new world for you, and that new world is completely different. Isaiah 65, 21, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the bull, and the dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. It's going to be different. Jesus is giving us more than we could ever, ever imagine. But not only will there be changes in the natural world, the Bible says there will be changes in the political world too. Now, in college, I studied political science. Before I became a Christian, the only thing I wanted out of life was to run for public office. That's all I wanted out of life. God corrected me, and he can save the least of us. Amen? <laughs> I gave that up. I thought, i got to follow Jesus. No offense to all of our... People who I do treasure those who volunteer to run for public office. I, I, I got to say that to all those who are watching out there. But you know what I've discovered is I studied that for four years at the university. Politics boils down to one thing. Politics boils down to a decision. Who gets what, when, and where? That's all politics is about. Who gets what, when, and where? And that's what's fueled movements like the communist revolution. Who gets what, when, and where? People said they have lots, we have none. We're going to force them to spread it around. It's who gets what, where, and when. God says, we don't have to worry about that in heaven because he owns it all and he gives it abundantly. You can have as much as you need. Listen to God's promise. The Bible says in Isaiah 65, 21, listen to this. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Now, wait a minute, preacher. The Bible says we're going to work in heaven. We're going to work in heaven. I thought I got some time off when I got there. Yo, you're going to work in heaven, all right, but it's going to be completely different. Listen to the difference. You're going to enjoy your work. See, I, I refuse to believe when Mozart composed a symphony that he really thought of that as work. It was sheer joy. God says you're going to get to create stuff. You're going to get to do stuff that has meaning. Your life's going to mean something. You're not going to punch a clock. I'm going to turn you loose in that new earth to go out and do what means most to you. The Bible says in the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve were tending and keeping that garden, doing things that brought them great joy. And in the new earth, we get to do it again. Things that bring us joy. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. 
In the kingdom of heaven, no one will ever cheat you out of your paycheck. In the kingdom of heaven, nobody's ever going to default on a contract because the only contract up there is God says, I will be your God and you will be my people, and he never breaks that contract. No one is ever going to break into your house and steal your stuff. God said, I'm giving you another world. What you create, you can enjoy. You're not going to punch the clock. You're not going to work for anybody else. Everything we do up here is for the honor and glory of God. That's what we do up here. You say, well, wait a minute. If it's all for God's honor and glory, am I going to enjoy it? Absolutely. The Bible says that God created you for his pleasure. And what brings him pleasure is when you have joy. It's the best scenario you can imagine. In heaven, the whole political realm changes. And not only does the political realm change, the Bible teaches us the whole religious world changes too. And I can't wait for this one. In the new earth, you won't ever have to worry about your kids burning in a compound in Waco. In the kingdom of heaven, there will be no cults. In the kingdom of heaven, there will be no strange religions. There will be no books that lead you astray. There will be no movies with bad religious ideas. There will be nobody lying about who God is or whether or not he loves you because you will be with God. And if you have a question, you can walk right up to Jesus himself and ask it and get the answer from God himself. There will never be another mistake in religion. You will be with God. Jesus gives it all back. Everything we threw away, he hands back to you. We will be with God. And then comes my favorite passage in all of the Bible. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Do you see it? It's all what Jesus wanted. He wanted that relationship back. He wanted the Garden of Eden back. And the day after the appearing, we step back into Eden. We get it all back. We will be with God. And the Bible says God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. God says you can take these words to the bank. You can write this down. In this world, a contract might not be worth the paper it's written on. But what I say is the truth. It's always been about God's word. In the Garden of Eden, the devil came and said, Has God really said not to eat of that tree? Has God really said you would die if you sin?" God said, I have always told you the truth. Write down these words. Everything I say is the truth. And if I say I'm coming again, I'm coming again. And if I say I'm going to wipe away all tears, I'm going to wipe away all tears. What have you shed tears over? What have you shed tears over? Some people listening tonight have broken families, ruined marriages. Some people have children that have turned their back on them. Some people have suffered with disease, heartache, a lot of pain. Some people have been desperately lonely. And God says in a heartbeat, just a moment from now, I'm going to hand you a miracle. I'm going to give you everything your heart has ever desired, and you will live in my presence. The tree of life will heal you. You will be in my company, and my family will never be broken again. God says, I'm about to hand you a miracle. Let me ask you a question. Do you need a miracle? Do you need a miracle in your life? Her name was Tessie. She was just a little girl, and one day as she was walking past the kitchen, she overheard a conversation that her mother and father were having together. Mommy said, Daddy, I don't know where we're going to get the money. We don't have money for that kind of thing. Well, we need to get the money, he said, because if we don't, Andrew's not going to get the operation. He won't make it. We've got to, but it's not an option. We just don't have the money. Tessie heard that. She thought about it for a moment. She ran to her bedroom, into the closet. She pulled out a little jelly jar. It had some change in it. She thought, I've got to help my brother. She poured the change out in her hand, counted it out methodically. It was $1.11. She thought, I wonder if that'll do it. I wonder if it'll do it. She bunched it up in her hand. She ran out the back door when Mommy and Daddy weren't looking. She ran down the street six blocks to the Rexall drugstore. 
She walked inside. The pharmacist was standing behind the counter talking to a well-dressed gentleman. And the conversation went on and on and on. And Tessie got impatient. She tapped her little foot. She counted her change. She cleared her throat a few times to try and get his attention, but couldn't. So finally, in desperation, she took one quarter and she plunked it down on the glass countertop very loudly. And the pharmacist turned around and said, what do you think you're doing, little lady? My brother came all the way from Chicago to visit with me. I haven't seen him in a long time, and you are interrupting us. Oh, said Tessie, I, I didn't mean to do that, but, but this is an emergency. My mommy says that there's something growing inside my brother's head and that we need a miracle. And I'm wondering, how much is a miracle? Can I buy one? He softened up a little bit. He said, young lady, we, we don't sell miracles here. We, we can't do that. But I have all this money. If it's not enough, I'll find some more. We, we don't sell miracles here. And just as Tessie collected her change, the well-dressed man stopped her and said, what, what exactly is wrong? She said, my mommy says something's growing I, I, in his head. He said, listen, I just might have your miracle. It was Dr. Carlton Armstrong, one of the prominent neurosurgeons in the country. He said, you send your mommy and daddy to talk to me. And they took Andrew to Chicago. They performed surgery. They saved the little boy's life. The bill was $1.11. Tessie's mommy and daddy gathered in the kitchen one night. They said, wow, I wonder what that would have cost. What's a miracle worth? Let me ask you a question tonight. What does your miracle cost? Jesus said he's going to hand it all back to you. He's going to give you your miracle what did it cost? It cost him everything he had. Because between that garden in Genesis and that garden in Revelation is the Son of God hanging on a cross. And he said, I want you to have it all because I miss you desperately. Let me ask you a question. God leaves you with a choice. He says, I'm gathering the whole world on the mountain of Megiddo. I'm calling you to make a decision just before I come. I bought you paradise. It cost me everything. I knew all you had was a dollar and 11 cents to your name, so I paid it all. What decision are you going to make before Jesus comes? Tonight, it's time to get out lesson number five as we think about the day after the appearing, and now we're going to study what the Word of God says about what God has in store for us. Well, if you're still with us by satellite and right here in Southern California, we're handing out lesson number five. And my good friend Dan Houghton's going to come and lead us through this final study in this five part series. But it's not the last study. You can keep studying wherever you are. Dan, take us through this lesson. Thank you, Pastor Tom. <clears throat> it's time to take out lesson number five. The last one in this series, although just like Pastor Sean said, this is just the beginning, not the end. You're going to have opportunity to continue studying, and I hope you make it a lifelong journey as you study. But the day after, did your heart thrill tonight as you heard Pastor Sean describe from Scripture what the day after the appearing is going to be like? Can you say yes to me about that? Yes. Isn't that going to be wonderful? Amen. I love the idea of... A, uh, you know, a conversation between Jesus and his father. Have you ever thought about what it would be like to actually listen in on that conversation? As he's talking about how much he loves you and wants you and me to be with him. 
I love the way that, that our study started tonight. But we want to ask that question, what do we discover about why Christ is coming back? And we're going to look at John 17, 24, where we get a chance to look at that or actually peek in on that conversation and listen, overhear it, if you will. Father, Jesus says, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. So, what do we discover about why Christ is coming back? He wants us with him where he is. Does it feel good to be wanted tonight? He wants each and every one of us. Now, many times people have portrayed the end of the world and other apocalyptic uh, events and themes in very frightening terms. Have you ever been afraid when you hear about some of the signs that we've talked about during this, this uh, seminar, like earthquakes or potential nuclear disaster or other things? Have you ever been afraid of that? What is Jesus' advice to us as we watch the world move towards its conclusion? We're going to look at John chapter 14 and verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. What is he saying? What advice does Jesus give to us as we watch the world move towards its conclusion? He says, let not your heart be troubled. And one of the reasons why we have the appearing seminar for you is to give you a little insight into what God's plan is so that your heart will not need to be troubled as we move down towards that grand finale called the appearing. Now, what is Christ accomplishing for us right now as we wait for him to come? Two passages of scripture. The first one is in Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 15 and 16. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He is there as our high priest, representing us in the heavenly courts. And he's doing that from the basis of experience because he knows what it's like to be like us. So number one in that, we'll get to it in just a moment, is he is our high priest. But let's look at John 14, verses 2 and 3 again. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He's preparing a special place for us. So we want to put that. What's he accomplishing for us right now? He is both preparing a place for us and representing us as high priest in heaven. Someone who understands what life is like here on this earth. So make sure you write down in your lesson that he is preparing a place for us and he is our high priest in the courts of heaven above. Tell you what, I think about him preparing a place for me and for my family. I think about him preparing a place for you and your family. That's very personal. Our God is interested in us at a very, very personal level, and he's interested in you in a personal level tonight. Okay, what are some of the things we know for sure about what Jesus is preparing for us? Pastor Sean took us through this list. I want you to go through the list again, and we're going to put it down in your lesson. Okay, the blind... Receive their what? Their sight. Have you ever been around someone who is blind? Have you ever had someone that you know that does not have their sight? You know, I have had to be the eyes for a friend of mine at one or uh, another time where we were looking at something and I would describe it for him. I just know that he is going to be so ecstatic whenever the time comes that he is able to see what he's only heard about. And there are literally thousands of those kinds of people that are going to be ha going to have their sight restored. What else did Pastor Sean tell us about? And as he read from scriptures, the deaf receive their what? Hearing. Their hearing. Have you ever thought what it would be like to be in a world where you cannot hear a single thing, totally quiet, without having any of the noises or the joyful sounds of children playing? going on around you. There are going to be many that receive their hearing at that time. And the lame are going to be able to walk. 
That's another thing that's going to happen when, when Jesus comes and what he's preparing for us. Those who cannot speak, the mute will speak. And here's another thing. You, you heard about the work that Pastor Sean was talking about in the garden. How many of you have a garden? Do you, do you, you know, I can remember the same thing. Sean, I think our dads must have known each other. Because I can remember whenever I was a little boy, I also, with my brother, were, was given the assignment to go out and work in the garden. And it was not my favorite thing. Now, some people love their gardens. But... All of our work will be fulfilling and productive. Sean, Pastor Sean, you and I will even enjoy working in a garden up there. Isn't that good? Okay, and nature will be at peace. We don't have to be afraid of wild animals or even the neighbor's dog or anything else. We don't have to be afraid because in heaven, nature is going to be at peace. When the eyes, this is Isaiah chapter 35, 5 and 6, then the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart. And the tongue of the dumb will sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Sounds like a beautiful, beautiful place. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people. And mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat, and they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. Now, what is going to be missing after Jesus returns? What is it? Look at number five in your lesson. Number five. What is going to be missing? We're going to turn to Revelation chapter 21, verses 4 and 5. Death, sorrow, crying, and pain. All of those things will no longer exist. So whenever you've cried from a broken heart, or you have experienced deep, deep sorrow and pain, all that's going to be gone. That's not going to exist. Can you imagine a world without pain? It's going to be wonderful. Now, what will be restored after Christ appears. Now we're going to look at Revelation chapter 22 verses 2 and 3 and then also Genesis chapter 317, okay? The paradise that we enjoyed in the garden of Eden will be restored complete with the river of life. Paradise and river. Okay, I, I put down just to summarize because that's a long answer on in that spot. The garden of Eden paradise is going to be restored. And there's going to be a river of life and also a tree of life. Now, according to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3, what is the whole purpose of Christ's return? What does he want to come back for anyway? You know, sometimes whenever I see the condition of our world, I wonder why he would want to come back. But he does. Aren't you glad that he wants to come back? The whole purpose of Christ's return is that so God can dwell with his people and enjoy a relationship with them. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to invite you over for dinner. You know, there's something special about having an opportunity to go out to dinner or be invited over to someone's home for dinner. He wants to come over to your house for dinner. He wants to talk about your deepest, darkest secrets, the, the things that are the most difficult in your life. He's longing to have a special relationship with his people. Now today, Jesus is knocking at your heart's door. And he invites you to be a part of his eternity. Now, you know, it's popular in some, uh, you've heard the kids say it, they'll they'll like something if they say, oh, this is really good. What, What do the kids say whenever you hear them say, oh, this is really good? What do they say? Yes. Have you ever heard that? I want to know, what is your answer going to be? Can you say it with me? Yes. We want to be with Jesus. We want him to be a part of our lives. Now, a little while ago, Pastor Sean, as he ended number five, the title, The Day After, he was inviting each and every one to make a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. And I want to end this study session with that same thing. 
His hands of invitation are open to each and every one of us tonight. That means you and that means me. And ma'am and sir, wherever you are, in whatever city you are where the satellite broadcast is coming to you, he's making that same appeal to you. He's making that special invitation where he's asking you to be his. He's telling you tonight that he wants to come back especially for you. In fact, if you were the only person that would make the decision, he would come back especially for you. I don't know about you, but I want to be there for his appearing. I want to say thank you, Jesus, for thinking about me, for thinking about my family, for thinking about all of your family and rescuing us from this planet that has gone crazy. I want to invite you right now while we pray to just in your heart say, yes, Lord, I want to be there at that appearing and I accept your invitation. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, Tonight, your invitation is ringing in our hearts. We hear it so clearly, that voice, that melodious voice of love that says, Come unto me, and I will give you rest. I pray that each one of us tonight will choose again and decide right now that we're going to be there for your appearing with a smile on our face and ready to say thank you, Jesus, for coming to take us home with you. I pray this in your precious name. Amen.